Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to uh, another wonderful presentation. We have Kin in. He's going to show us how to uh, digitize our film from home. Um, so, Kin, welcome to the studio. Uh, hey, thanks thank for, you having for joining me. us today. Thanks yeah, for having me. I'm really looking forward to Looking forward to what you all have uh, set up for us to learn today. All right. Thank you, Shauna. Um, well, I'm going to just let you take over. The show's all yours. Perfect. All right. Here we go, guys. Um, so, uh, Shauna, if uh, you may uh, put up the um, slideshow on, too. Okay. So, realistically, um, I would take it that, like, a lot of us... Um, have recently been like getting into like um getting back into doing film photography and there's a huge resurgence of it all um since the lockdown have begun and so far oh here we go so far um i have slowly been moving and a lot of other people have also been slowly from moving from using a lab scan over to try and do it at home because we try to minimize um, how much, you know, how much time, how many times we go out um, just, you know, just so that, you know, we try to limit and not go out like so often just to limit like our exposure to whatever. Um, so here we go. So today we're going to talk about how the basics of converting um, your, um, your uh, film negative from uh, through using a mirrorless or even a DSLR camera that you have, through that converting the file, and then uh, how to use the holder, how to build your own holder, hopefully, and how to convert that film negative into a positive, into a digital file that you can share, you can post up, and you can archive. OK, so traditionally, um, you bring it to a labs for scanning, and they usually use the Pacon. Um, this one is, uh, I think, the Pacon F135, the CoolScan 9000, and some labs would have the nice uh, current newer high generation of uh, the Hasselblad X1, the X15 for really high-end scan. The nice thing about having those is that there's a very specific color consistency the lab can offer because um, traditionally they have about 20 years of experience of Kodak calibrating different color profile for the scanner. So that's the advantage of going to a lab for a lab scan. But um, as I was saying, sometimes uh, when we're in lockdown, you might not be able to gain access to the uh, lab scan all the time. And also, we may not, um, we may have our own set of color that we prefer. So that's when the home scanning would come in handy. Um, Shauna, if uh, I can jump in next. So, oops, uh, the one right before this one? Yes. So traditionally, for home scanning, you can still buy um, flatbed type of scanner or a dedicated film scanner. For example, the more popular one is the Epson V6000 and the updated version, the V550. Um, they're kind of in the 200 something dollar range. Uh, and you can go up to a V750, V800, Epson, V850. And those guys, you're heading up to approximately um, 800 to $1,000. So they're not cheap for mainly using just for film scanning. There's also the Plus Tech. Um, I believe those are the 8,000 series, uh, and they are still approximately around $600. Um, and those are usually dedicated for 35 millimeter for a plus tech, and then the uh, absent one can go for um, medium format. Uh, and perhaps if you stitch it, you can also scan large format. However, um, they do take quite a, take up quite some time, and the automated feature may not be the best for what you want to do. So in the past, I have tried to scan a whole row of 35 millimeter on my absent, and it takes almost half a day just to finish it off. And that become kind of too cumbersome um, for my use. Um, 
So yeah, um, you can still, with those scanner, you can still convert to a DNG, which is like a film, neg sorry, a digital negative file. Um, so it's still usable if you want more control over what you want to do. Now, moving on to um, using your digital camera, your DSR, or your mirrorless to scan your item. So the nice thing is that you have you have easy access. It's at home. You can do it at any point. Uh, with a proper light source, you can even do it at daytime. I prefer to scan mine at nighttime, just so I have less stray light that can affect my uh, scanning. Um, and also, you can set it up. Uh, the setup could be modular at any budget you want. Say if you don't want to spend that much money at the time, and you already have a macro lens and a camera, then your cost can significantly reduce itself. Uh, and also, depending on the megapixels your camera have, you can have a larger or smaller scan, uh, and you can even shoot various different odd sizes film negative you if you want to, uh, depending on the film negative holder that you have. Now, the cons in this, I do have to say, is that um, you have to do everything kind of manually uh, when you're moving the film along, but it's Actually, once you get the hang of it, it's pretty fast, because especially if you establish like some sort of system and how quickly you can move from one frame to the next. Um, and also, because with this um, setup, you have to manually kind of, let me grab my camera here. So you have your camera here. You have to manually kind of adjust your focus um, and double check it on your camera. So that could be a little bit cumbersome, too initially. But once you have it set up, theoretically, you can kind of move along one frame to the next without needing to readjust the manual focus every frame. And the, also, the other nice thing is uh, in the long run, if you do have a large volume of film negative to go through, you can actually save a lot in costs. And you control, you absolutely control all the different colors that you prefer to have. Uh, and how your negative one to look. Sorry, uh, can we hop to the next shots? Okay, so this is what you need for your for your basic free components for your digital scanning. One, you need to have some sort of film holder. So on the slide, I posted up uh, an example. That one is called the essential film holder. But what you can also do uh, up here, I have. Um, I have kind of made one kind of like a, my own version of it uh, at the same time. So you can kind of do something like this. Uh, uh, and we'll go through how I have made some of these guys and the basic design. And it's basically the basic principles. So once you get the principle down, you can make your own film holder without much problem. Uh, personally, I still kind of enjoy having one of those pre-made ones because they're pre-made for a reason. OK, so second component, you want to have your digital camera with your macro lens. And you also want to have a tripod uh, that can hold your camera rig, uh, turning it downward, so it can um, frame it and take the photo properly without having any kind of camera shake. And the third component for this setup is that you need to have um, a proper um, editing software. Uh, in, this in this case, I'm using Lightroom Classic. But I've also seen people use uh, Photoshop and do it manually. Uh, but for mine, in Lightroom, I'm using Lightroom Classic with the Negative Lab Pro plugged in. And we're going to quick, uh, quickly go over that at the end of the presentation. Okay, so. If we can hop to the next slide. So the material for um, creating your film holder. So one, you need black foam core. That's what this uh, frame is made out of. Or you can use any kind of cardboard boxes. Uh, in this case, um, this box is actually one of the smaller Amazon box that I found. And it seems to fit pretty well for what I want to use, because mostly I'm scanning 135 millimeter and sorry, 135 and 120 um, type film. Sorry about the millimeter part. I know some people get really uh, upset about that. It is 135 format and 
120 format. Um, and also, I have been using black gaffer tape for taping up the surroundings and taping up the system. And also, you need a cutter and scissors. Optional material that you can use um, for this setup is uh, I have bought myself some self-adhesive foam sheets and also large clips to hold down the holder and film. It's mostly used to hold down the holder because I still want the film to be able to slide in and out. Okay. And, and other optional parts for the film holder uh, is if you have still have black foam cord remaining that you haven't used when you make the holder, you can actually cut them out to be land shades or some kind of hood to go around the border where you want to scan in case if you're scanning your film in daytime. So sometimes in daytime, you have a lot of um, spill lights from around you. You don't want that spill light to appear when you're scanning. And um, if, in case if also your lens doesn't have a lens hood or you can't find it or you lost it, you can build kind of like a lens shape around where you want to scan and place it on top just to block out any stray lights. Um, so the piece of glass that I have typically used, say in this, uh, in this one that I've made, uh, I cut out the frame of uh, the holder to be to fit medium format film, so 120 film. And what I have done is I have taken one of the pieces of glass from like a cheap four by six photo frame, and I've actually taped it underneath as a support, uh, as a film support um, for when you glide the film through it. Now, um, one thing uh, people might be of concern in this case is that uh, for some of you who have done flatbed scanning or some of you have done other type of film scanning in the past, you may notice that with regular film, uh, if you place them directly on top unevenly on regular glass, you can actually gain Newton ring uh, if not careful. But so far, uh, when I have built this, when I slide a film into it, because I leave a little bit thicker kind of gap for um, sliding the film in, I never really have a very uneven film negative that causes Newton ring on the cheap photo frame glass on here. So it's something that you can kind of experiment and test. But if, um, if you're actually worried about potential Newton ring, um, what you can also do is on the other type of film holder, because it's tension based, because I'm clamping down, there's no glass, there's nothing underneath it in any way, shape or form. So there's absolutely no risk of that happening. Okay, let's see. Okay, so as for light source, so we need to have a light source to kind of project light through the negative into the camera. So for a light source, uh, what I've been using and what I recommend is one of the Godox um, LED panel. So these kind of panel, as you can see, it's the 120, this is the 120C. It's already large enough for a medium format. Uh, let's see. Like just like that. It's already large enough for medium format. It's definitely large enough for 135. But if you have odd sizes um, negative, uh, say for example, your medium format, if it goes beyond six by nine, uh, say you're using some sort of um, homemade pinhole camera, you can always go for one size larger. And that's the, um, that's the LED P260. Um, that's roughly about this much. So it's a little bit bigger. And the nice thing about these lights is that the CRI is approximately 95, a little bit above 95, and TLCI is 94. What that means is uh, it creates a pretty good reproduction of daylight color without too much variation between the green tone and the magenta tone in terms of the TLCI. Uh, and a couple of other colors too, but mostly that's what you got to watch out for. However, I do have to say um, for
for when you're creating your own homemade film holder, and you're also using uh, your own type of diffuser for the lights, that might still shift the light a little bit. Um, but once you're editing, you're running through the, uh, you're selecting the correct white balance when you're processing the film, that problem should go away. Now, for the other thing about this kind of light is that, oops, sorry, can I go back there? Um, the other nice thing about this kind of light is that it uses a battery system. So meaning your setup is quite portable. Um, they use the Sony NPF batteries and you can, I know McBain actually sells the, um, the 770 and also the uh, 980 type. Um, so this is like the 980 type is a larger one and these would definitely last you all day long. Um, versus the the other option that they also have, the 770, that one, um, it's like, I think a quarter smaller than this guy, or maybe one for smaller than this guy, but it should still last you for many, many hours for when you are doing your film scanning. So meaning if you're doing, you're spending a whole day archiving a whole binder full of film negative, it should technically keep you going for hours and hours. And even if you forgot to charge it, next time when you use it, you should be able to still use it for a good chunk of time, I would say. And uh, these guys are typically, you're looking ranging from, uh, I think, 180 for um, the 2770 with the charger and approximately the same thing for the... Um, the 9, 9, uh, 980 battery. And as for the panels itself, the small ones, I believe they go for around $70. And the larger one, I believe they go for around 130 give or take. And also, obviously, light sources like these, you can always use for something else. You can use it to light up uh, when you're sh when you're shooting outside, you need so you need a constant light to kind of light up your subject. Or if you're doing video, you can still use these light panels for other purposes. Um, and sorry, Sh Shauna, if you can move to the next one. Now, uh, when I was talking about the fusion panel uh, for using these kind of lights, what you may notice is it's the light itself is pretty. Um, it's like a, it's kind of works like a spotlight too. And it's pretty harsh, and sometimes you might want to diffuse it just a little bit to have a more even surface. What I what most people have done, if you have access to it, is if you can find white acrylic plexiglass sheets, I find them to work the best, uh, and usually they shouldn't cost you more than fifteen dollars for a piece. However, if you don't want or if you don't have access to a local place that sells that or if you don't want to cut it to size that you want what i have tried before and it works quite effectively is i have brought this shower curtain from dollar store and i also bought a similar type of tablecloth from dollar store for a dollar 25 and i have just cut out like a small piece of it and fold it twice just to work as a diffusion on top of the light and it seems to work really really well to give out like really even light um so that's what i've done so meaning i would have my light here on the table i would have my diffusion sheets on top and i'll try to i might sometimes i might even mount it down with tape and i would have my film holder on top going over it and now my film sliding in and through so I can pull, I can pull my, my film from one side to the other while taking photos of it. Okay. Can, yeah. So another light source, I actually recommend that came out recently. So this light is the um, ES45. It's actually, the intention of this is actually a much larger one. Uh, in case if you have larger kind of film negative, like a large format, uh, four by five or bigger. Um, the nice thing about this panel is that instead of having your traditional LED light panel where your light is directly behind, it's creating a hotter spot 
Um, this guy actually have the light surrounding the edge of this and actually spill out a very even kind of lighting. The intention for this is actually for um, streamers, like uh, people who go on Twitch, like gamers who go on Twitch and whatnot, and they use it as a light panel for their face. So kind of similar to what you see here, where I have like a like like a larger size light source to light on my face to have a softer light. This was intended for that, but because it's so soft and so even, you can actually use this without any diffusion to scan your film. And the other thing I like about this is also A is by color, B they have a little remote control out here where you can change up, let's see if I'm gonna turn this, you can change up your power and you can change up the white balance and uh, and you can even change up, um, well, you can also check your battery power on here. So when you're scanning, if you don't want to be around your scanning table because you want to reduce any kind of artificial shake you might introduce to it, you can use the remote to kind of change up your setting. And it's magnetic, kind of neat. So I think these guys are around 180 uh, and it also comes with the little stand uh, that you can clamp it onto a table in case if you ever want to use it for other purposes such as um, if you go on a Zoom meeting or you go you like you do live stream you want a softer light source for your face you can use that okay so if we can move to the next one okay uh, okay so this would be let's see these would be the final product I was showing you. So on the left here, on the slide, this is the larger um, film holder box that I have made. Uh, as I was saying, this is like the smaller Amazon box with the side cut out. Uh, this would fit, I have been scanning mostly six by seven, six by nine on this. Um, all you need to do for size is that um, you just have to measure roughly the size of your negative and you cut it to, to match the size. Now, even if your size is slightly larger, that's fine. Uh, what I've done in the past is I actually have left it to be a little bit bigger than what the film size should be for the width, just so that um, I, if I ever want to have the information of the side of the film saying what film it is, you can have that. So the border uh, of the of the of negative, if you want to show that information, you can always cut it larger. So you have that when you're scanning your film. Um, and also the other thing is if you ever don't want that because uh, you find yourself having stray light hitting your negative when you're scanning, you can always use gaffer tape either tape this down smaller or what I've also done is I've used gaffer tape and I just tape one end of the tape to the other, kind of like double side, and I create a new kind of mass to overlay on top of the box so I can like frame it properly too. So you can do that. Um, and I've also done that for, I've just make like a separate mass for 35 millimeter film. Uh, just because it's, I'm gonna, I can use the same holder. I just overlay a mask on top. And the other part of this um, holder is that if you look at the picture on the right, that there is actually a slit that I cut out. Um, I don't know if you can see that properly right there. A uh, slit I cut out just so I can feed the film through it. So when I was creating this, uh, I kind of measure it a little bit too tight. But if you find it the, the slit to be a little bit too thin, you can always cut it bigger later on, which is what I did here. And I'll show you the back of my holder. So see, you see that little reflection where the glass is? See right there. So on the glass, on the top and on the bottom of the glass, I actually edit in a kind of like a guide with the adhesive foam piece that I have because the foam sheet is very, very thin. They're about maybe like two to three millimeter thickness, but I kind of add it to it so the film can have a little bit more space to 
um, glide through the holder when you pull it from one direction to the others. Because if it is too tight, you might actually A, either scratch your negative, or B, you might have a hard time moving the film negative from one end to the next. And then the other film holder I have, Shana, if I can, yeah, thanks. The other film holder I have created is that uh, is this guy. So this guy, I have basically just been using the larger size clips to hold it down. But also when you break it down, it basically, let me try to get that open. It basically, as you can see, it consists of two piece on here. Let me get the film off. So you have one holder on here and the other one that looks identical. But what I've also done is I have cut out the adhesive uh, foam as like a guide again from one side and the next. So the film can have like a slight, it ha would have a slight elevation for the film to glide right through. I think you might be able to see it better inside the, uh, on the photo in the middle bottom where it raises a little bit. Now, an alternative that you can also use in case if you think the foam is a little too thick for your liking is you can, uh, you can use regular cardboard, thin cardboard that you can use. Um, and you just cut the same guide and glue it to one end of the holder here. So your film can easily slide through. Because I think most cardboard should still be a little bit thicker than your regular film negative. So meaning, when it's on here, it would quickly glide through here when you move it along the place. All right. Here we go. This is uh, kind of the final product. Uh, what I've also done is I have mixed and matched the two separate holder uh, where I would have this guy being placed on top of this other one. But they can technically work separately in their own separate way. Uh, I just kind of like having this because uh, I already know how much thickness I have on here. Uh, when the light goes through it, so I can have a better adjustment on it. Okay. So, um, Shana, if I can uh, pop to the next slide. There we go. Oh, the one right before. So, just in case if you guys are wondering, there are pre-made film holder options that uh, if you don't mind spending some money on it, uh, they're actually quite worth your time too. So the one that I've mostly been using is my uh, Essential Film Holder, uh, which is right here. Uh, and as you can see, I can easily glide my film through um, the holder itself. The way it works is it's still the two pieces of holder holding onto uh, your film with an acrylic piece on the bottom to diffuse your lights. Uh, I believe these guys are coming through from UK and they range from uh, from late 100 to mid 200 and up to 300 depending on what kind of package you want. Uh, they seem to be, I think, one of the best bang for the buck. Uh, and the Viallo, uh, the 360 film holder and a negative supply film carrier are kind of the slightly higher end film holder that you can buy. Um, the way they work is when you feed the film into them, they have a little notch that you actually rotate it and they would automatically feed your film through it. Uh, and also to make sure it stays perfectly flat. Uh, I think the Viallo one is about five to six hundred depending on what kind of package you're buying and the negative supply one goes up to eight to a thousand dollars which is quite a bit um of money which is kind of why i kind of stuck to my homemade one and also the essential film holder because um when it comes down to it as long as you can keep your negative flat uh, and you have a proper light source, you can scan it pretty easily without much issue. Um, and then the other option that you can think of 
if you already have these at home um is that if you have an old and larger film and larger at home they do have a negative carrier and they literally would work exactly the same way in principle because all you're doing on a larger is that you're shooting light through it to project it onto the film paper versus in this case you're doing the reverse you're shooting light through it into a camera and your camera is basically just capturing a digital image of that picture so these guys you can probably find them i've seen them online from under ten dollars to up to like thirty forty dollars uh on ebay and whatnot you can find them and also you can pretty easily find 3d printed version of them um to work and they can range from five dollars to ten dollars each so it shouldn't be hard um and another option out there is that for nikon users nikon also have actually they have an es1 and an es2 slide digitalizer um and these guys i don't remember roughly how much they're i think they're mid hundred somewhere in there uh and the way it works is you can point it to any light source be it outside into the sun or you use a flash or use an led shooting directly into it but you basically mount the slide digitalizer in front of your lens and you shoot through it and on the nikon camera they actually i think it's the 850 and also the newer dsr um, they also have a negative conversion filter or, or sorry a filter a function uh, on the camera where you can do the conversion from negative to positive inside the camera itself so that's something to uh, for nikon users to consider too okay other tools so shauna if i can hop over to uh, the next slide So other tools you need for scanning, obviously you need a tripod. Now, uh, I was showing a picture here. A regular tripod with like a freeway head or any kind of even a ball head would work uh, when you kind of tilt your camera for, uh, downward facing um, downward toward the slot, uh, the film negative, sorry. But if you can find or if you have a tripod that actually have a tilting center column, uh, which is kind of like the one that I've shown on here, uh, one of them in Frodo X555 Pro series. That actually would give you a little bit more leeway to work because your camera can stick out a little bit more and your film holder doesn't have to stay as close to your tripod as it needs to be. So that's something to consider too. However, if you're starting, you have a tripod already, or you're just looking for a basic tripod to start off with, you can always try it with a regular tripod, just simply tilting it downward to shoot it. Another thing, uh, another two things that you want to have is one, you need to have a surface for it to, for, for you to hold, put your um, film holder onto. I highly recommend using a basic coffee table. They're not expensive. You probably have one lying at home already, um, and it ensured as flat. So I just usually I just put. Uh, my film holder on top of the coffee table, turn on the lights, place the tripod over top, and shoot it. Uh, also, definitely, definitely a blower or air blower. Um, and those are about $20 or less. Uh, and also those lint-free kind of white kind of gloves or cotton gloves that you can have for handling your negative. Because the last thing you want is to have your fingerprint all over the negative that you're trying to shoot. And also it helps to keep some of the dust and other stuff away from your negative. Also, I forgot to place it in here, having a lens pen with the brush or any kind of soft brush to brush away the dust when you're scanning helps tremendously when you're scanning your film. I actually tend to do this uh, every other frame if i'm in a high dusty environment while I'm scanning uh, or if i haven't vacuumed the area for a long time uh, i typically have a lens pen next to me just to wipe off the dust on here uh, every 
every shot or every other shot that I'm scanning. Uh, also, because um, when you're scanning digitally through this, you don't have uh, a dust reduction software like a regular scanner would have. And you definitely don't want to deal with dust if you don't have to once you're scanning your film uh, because it actually does add up quite a bit of time in the long run. And Shana, next slide, yeah. And other accessories that I recommend having when you're doing your scanning is to have some sort of bubble level uh, because when you're scanning, you want to make sure your camera is actually at a 90 degree angle and is perfectly straight instead of tilting to one side or the other, uh, which is something you should look out for if you're scanning for a long period of time. Because when you first mount your camera onto the tripod pointing downward, it might be perfectly straight. But because your camera, say your hand grip is on one side, your weight might be tilting toward on one side. Once you have been scanning for a long period of time, your camera might start to tilt one way. So what I usually do have is I would have a bubble level, some sort of bubble level on top, or I turn on the, um, the electronic level in the camera too, just to make sure my camera is perfectly level. Another thing is also to use the same bubble level on the coffee table or whatever surface you're placing your holder on, just to make sure your camera and your film is perfectly level too, because you want to make sure your skin is perfectly flat. What other people have also, a uh, little trick that they have done is they place a mirror where the, on top of where the holder is going to be at. Um, so the holder is here to place the mirror on top. So your camera can actually see, um, if you can look at the detail of your lens, say like it's a 90 millimeter, Sony, et cetera, et cetera, you can see how level it is. This is like a little mirror trick. So you can make sure your camera is perfectly level in comparison to your film. So this is what the, um, Sean, yeah, this is what the setup would look like. So you have your camera, if you look at a picture on the left, your camera pointing downward perfectly straight, and you have your film holder underneath. Uh, and you're, tr you're going to try to manually focus the camera to capture the file. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the core, very basics of the camera setting when you're trying to digitize your film. So Shana, if I can hop to the next slide. So first thing, on your lens, A, you want to make sure it's a macro lens. Uh, I have on display here one of the 7 Artisan, I think this is a 60 millimeter version 2. Uh, they are the, one of the least expensive macro lens that perform really well without causing too much. I believe they are uh, two, three hundred dollars, give or take. Uh, and But regardless, um, with macro lenses, uh, you want to or even other type of lenses, you want to tune your aperture to be about f8 to f11 for two reasons. One, uh, you want to make sure you have enough depth of field to capture the whole plane of the, uh, sorry, the whole film. Because let's say if your film isn't perfectly, perfectly flat in comparison to your camera, so let's say it's warped just a little bit. If you have a smaller aperture, it's still enough depth of field to capture the whole frame. So you can still fix your uh, perspective of your scan inside Lightroom or inside Photoshop without worrying that one end of the film is in focus versus the other end isn't. So that's one little thing. The other thing is also typically most lenses, as you know, perform the best. I'm talking about full frame lenses here, uh, or, or APS-C lenses here. Typically, they perform the best from aperture f8 to f11. So that's also when you get the most optimal sharpness throughout the lens. And because you're scanning a film negative itself, you want the whole plane to be in perfect focus. So that's why you want to make, keep those two um, little things about the aperture setting in mind. Um, and in case if I haven't brought this up, uh, when you're scanning your film, you are shooting in full manual setting, meaning 
you're manual focusing and you're setting up your exposure manually too. Okay, sorry, um, Shauna, yeah, thanks. Uh, focus setting, so you're using manual focus. Uh, my personal favorite is I custom button the, the camera, because most camera you have have several custom buttons. Like on the Sony here, you have one, two, three, uh, four, and then some of the other guys have five on here. I typically customize one of them to be a focus magnifier. Reason being, when you're scanning your film, when you pull in the manual focus, you want to magnify your uh, your your camera to see if you can find the perfect focus on your film, just to make sure you have like this perfect sharpness when you're scanning your film. And then for others, uh, especially for mirrorless, uh, most of them would also have what they call um, focus peaking. So what focus peaking does is when you turn it, when it's in focus, it will light up whatever is in focus. You want to turn that on too, just to make sure it helps you to pull the better perfect focus that you can get from it. Let's see. Uh, oh, um, ritual uh, clean. So cleaning mold from it. Uh, typically molding uh, in the past, uh, sometimes like I use, I try not to use anything too destructive. Uh, if you have, um, if you have type, uh, let's see, if you have some type of like wiping alcohol, I tend to kind of dilute it just a little bit with um, non-mineral water and using a kill tip just to kind of lightly clean it itself but um i'm not the expert in this because so far i haven't really encountered much of um molding on my uh on my film negative too but usually once you have done that you place it in the sun you you kind of well should i shouldn't say direct sun but like you kind of let a little bit of sunlight go through it not direct uh kind of dry it off and clean it it helps okay Hopefully that answers some of your question, but I would say keep looking for other solutions too because I definitely haven't really like have much experience with that kind of um, that kind of problem. I actually have a little bit more experience in cleaning lens element um, with molding, but that's another topic. Okay, so let's come back to this uh, focus setting for the manual focus. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, Shauna, if I can move on to the next slide. Yes, please, thanks. So peaking level, I usually prefer using it at high or medium, just so I have a better view of what is in focus. And I typically also use the red color um, for uh, red or yellow, but usually I prefer to use the red color for when I'm scanning, especially color C41 film. Uh, it also works really well for black and white film. Um, the white and the yellow typically is not as obvious when I'm scanning the film itself. So that's why I stick to the red. But I know for Fuji, you have the green and then other brands have different colors. You can kind of experiment with different uh, type of peak color to see what works best for your camera and your setup. Uh, let's see. So this is an example of focusing on a color negative with focus peaking. This is a C41 regular typical color negative. Uh, if you can tell, you see the red on there? The red is where it's telling me is in focus. Um, but it almost looks like when you're, when you're zoom out all this way, this is like a regular perspective. When you zoom out all this way, um, the red is going to appear everywhere. So, which is why, as I was mentioning before, I typically use um, the focus magnifier to zoom in to find a better focus. Uh, if I can jump to the next slide. So once you, oops, sorry, go back one slide. So once you punch in, uh, you can see the, the, the photo on the right and on the bottom. 
I jump into magnifying at 4.2 times and 8.3 times. I really push it in to find the best focus uh, or the sharpest thing that I can find to pull my focus on. In this case, this is a, uh, in case if you weren't able to tell, um, this, so this is like a portrait shot with a person wearing a hat and the hat, her eyes and also the hat, the, the, um, the, the braiding pattern on the hat um, is actually one of the sharpest points. So when I zoom in, I punch into the hat itself to pull the sharpest point of focus. And then that way I can ensure I have the best focus for that um, shot. And also in case if you ever have, if for a lot of people who shoot a lot of portrait at very shallow depth of field, um, if you have one shot that have like perfect focus for you to pull on and you move on to the next shots where you, you find it hard to find the perfect focusing point when you're scanning it, if you've done a good job in pulling the focus on the first shot, on your on your other shot, technically your shot would still be in perfect focus when you're scanning it. So um, that's one little trick where you gotta make sure you have pulled the perfect focus on your one shot in your roll of film, just so you, the rest of your film would have really, really good, sharp, perfect focus when you're scanning too. Okay, so here's another tool that can also help you when you're scanning. Um, because we just talked about aperture, now we're gonna talk about shutter. Um, so shutter, um, the basic principle of it, it's also when you're scanning your film, your shutter speed might be a little bit slower than usual, which is why we have it on a tripod. Um, but at the same time, when you're doing it slowly, you can introduce any kind of <clears throat> any kind of shutter shake to it. Um, if you're close by or if you're standing on carpet, which I don't, so I don't recommend scanning anything when you're on carpet because it will shift. Try to scan everything when you're, your table and your tripod is on um, wooden floor or even cement or anything solid. <clears throat> you want to use some sort of shutter release cable, remotes, uh, or even a timer remote that you have to trigger your shutter so you, you can be further away or you're not physically touching the shutter button on your camera. So in this case, um, uh, for a lot of users, they have like DSRs, they have, uh, I think the Nikon and the Canon infrared remote trigger, they go for about 20 to $30 here and there. Uh, if you have a, a Fuji camera, a lot of them also have the traditional shutter release, mechanical shutter release cable threads that you can use. Um, those are around 15, 10, 15, 20 dollars. And for those of you who shoot a lot of time lapse, like uh, landscape photographers, you can still use your your, uh, your timer kind of intermonitor trigger to use this to trigger your camera. Uh, but if you don't have any of those on hand uh, and in a pinch, Maybe I can jump to the next slide. Um, what you can also do is a lot of the newer mirrorless cameras and a lot of the newer DSR cameras, they have their own Wi-Fi or Bluetooth app for you to control your sh or release your shutter through um, the app. So if you have an app, you can use that to trigger as a, like a remote trigger too. And if you also don't have that, you can all, what you can also do, turn on your timer um, for your shutter release. So turn on, say for example, in this case, turn on the 10 seconds timer. So you have enough time to move out the way or far enough so that there's no physical shake uh, when you're taking your shots. Uh, and for shutter setting, if your camera has a uh, electronic shutter, turn it on because any kind of shutter shake can introduce kind of shakiness into the film that you're scanning. So if there's an electronic shutter on it, use it. Uh, and if you don't, you just have to turn up the power on the LED panel uh, so you can take a shorter shutter uh, shots when you're taking the photo. So it re also reduces your shutter shake. Okay, next one. Uh, also when you're using your ISO, 
make sure you lower to the lowest that you can go natively on your camera's photo setting. So in this case, usually uh, they're usually at around ISO 100 or 200. Um, this way, you don't introduce any kind of digital noise to your film negative uh, if you don't have to, because you already got film grain. You want to represent the film grain of your shots uh, when you digitalize it, but you don't want to introduce any or complicate it with any kind of digital noise when you're shooting on it. Okay. And for your exposure setting, because you're already on a tripod, don't be afraid to use a slightly shower kind of shutter speed uh, that you can go with and turn on the histogram so you can see you're not over or under exposing it. Uh, what I do find is when I'm metering it, sometimes I do go up maybe like plus 0.3 or negative 0.3 when I'm taking the shots, like just a little bit over, just a little bit lower. It, that doesn't matter that much, as long as your histogram is telling you that you're not overexposing or underexposing too much, because you want a middle of the ground exposure. So your digital file can give you the maximum amount of information when you're processing it. Let's see, and this is one more thing I kind of throw it into the setting. For those of you who have a camera that have pixel shift stitching, um, or uh, you're thinking of getting one, they are kind of handy too when you're scanning your film negative. Uh, for most people, they are more than happy with, uh, say, 16, 24 megapixels. But if you are shooting, say, for example, you're trying to scan a medium format or a large format um, film negative, you want more megapixel to work with. So different brands have, have their own model. I know the Sony, the R series. Uh, natively, they're already, um, I think, 42 megapixels, 60 megapixels, but with the pixel stitching, they can go up to 160 and 200 something megapixels. So when, if you're scanning a large format, that's tremendously helpful. Uh, Olympus, all their newer, um, all their newer EM5, EM1, the, the version two of them, those guys also have that options. Pantax, uh, the K12 and the KP, same thing. And I believe Panasonic G9 uh, for the for the Micro Four Thirds and also the the S1, S1R, they also have that function. Uh, now keep in mind some of them, uh, I know the Panasonic one they do inside a camera body, but for the Sony one, you actually, once they take the photo, you have to use separate software to stitch them. So if you're choosing your camera, like you're thinking of buying one for that purpose, keep that in mind, read about it. But uh, if you already have a camera, you're happy with it, you can just keep going with it. Or if you have one that have that function and you haven't tried and used it yet, consider testing that too. Okay, now, um, last part, we're gonna talk about software and plugin. I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, so the most popular one that's going around, the most popular or, or the easiest one that I can comprehend in using it is called Negative Lab Pro. It's built for Lightroom Classic. Uh, it's a plugin for Lightroom Classic. Uh, you can download a demo from their website, and I believe they give you, I can't remember if they give you 10 shots or 25 shots for free that you can test with. Uh, the full version of it will cost 100 US dollars. Um, that's it, it's like pay one time, you get it. And the creator, Nathan, he have been actually have been updating it um, pretty frequently to accommodate um, digital scanning, through SLRs and different kind of camera profile too. So for me, I think it's definitely something that's worth it for your investment in the long run. But definitely check out the demo version if you haven't figured it out yet. Um, and Shauna, I'm gonna try something daring right now. I'm gonna try to share my own screen in doing, using that. Um, let's see if I can, uh, share my screen. So I'm going to try to um, show you how I do one of my film negative using um, using the software. 
Okay, show screen. Let's see, Windows. Let me go to my Lightroom. Share. Okay. Let's see. Perfect. So it's showing. <clears throat> so let's say I scan a whole batch of all the um, all the shots from that one row. I already, as you can see, I already did some of them. So I have all these different um, film that I have scanned. So the way this software works is, let's say I choose shot number two, and I wanted to develop it. Uh, first, let me rotate it. Uh, rotate right. What you want to do, if you can see my uh, cursor over here. Oh, it's actually not showing everything. So I need to actually, sh uh, I'll show you, um, I got to scan for, If you do you see the, um, the little color picker. Uh, I'm selecting my white balance right now, and I just gotta click on it. So that way, the the software, the plugin, would know that I'm actually selecting um, the the white white balance for this. And I also would what I want to do. I need to crop it down to just the picture that I want to use. Uh, in this case, it's just down here. There we go, somewhere in here. So here, I got the picture that I want to edit. Um, what you got to do is, oh, it's actually not showing. Sorry, I should have tested this. It's actually not showing you the menu that I'm using. Um, but let's see. So I can actually open up Negative Flap Pro, the plugged in. And I'll show you a screenshot of it afterwards. Um, just to show you. But all I need to do is convert negative. It's literally just one click of a button. And they kind of give me a preview of what it looks like. Well, like I didn't really have to do much of anything. It's kind of close to what I want to choose. And inside the editing um, plugged in um, interface, I can still change the white balance. Uh, I can warm it up a little. And I can warm up her skin a little by adding a little bit more magenta. And I can still change the brightness and contrast. So here, let's cancel that. Uh, stop sharing. So Shauna, if I can ask you to open up that. Um, yes. So on here, uh, if you look carefully, um, you see that little panel? off on the right with the interface is actually where I was doing all the magic in there when I was when I was trying to show show it to you guys using the uh, Lightroom plugged in. You can change the brightness, you can change the contrast, um, and you can also change the the highlight, the white, the shadow, the blacks, and on the bottom you can actually select what kind of color profile you want. You can choose from, they have different, I think four different type of scanner profile that you can choose from to your liking. Some of them have a stronger green tone. Some of them have a have a closer to a Kodak kind of color. Uh, and also on the very top, I was using the traditional lab scan uh, kind of neutral color profile. You can also choose a preset where there's a higher contrast, it's, uh, or if you have a shot that you're blown out, you can choose one that saved the highlight, things like that. And that's the Negative Lab Pro, I believe this is version 2.2, uh, which is the current one that they have. They have just released a version 2.3 beta, I believe two weeks ago. Uh, and as far as I can tell, some people find um, even nicer color tone that they can choose from with the color picker that they can choose if they want to choose the white balance. Uh, so yeah, it's something worth looking to into. Again, the name is Negative Lab Pro. They're not affiliated with us in any way, shape, or form. I just find them to be one of the easiest one to use. Um, sorry, I kind of running a little bit tight on time, but I do want to ask, are there any questions or if there were any questions that I have missed on here?
No, uh, I haven't. Uh, I haven't. So they're asking the, the, the damn book guy to digitalizing your photo with your camera and Lightroom. I haven't. Um, I would wonder if, um, if that's also teaching you how to do it manually with a plugged in, um, because uh, one way I know uh, to do it is to simply create a reverse curve for the the um, for the photo, um, and then you also subtract the film color from your film negative, uh, and then you change the RGB channel into having the right um, film color that you want. However, I gotta be honest, I haven't really been successful in doing that, which is kind of why I also went into Negative Lab Pro using that because that seems to be the easiest tool for me. But it's definitely something I should check out. Thanks, Rick. Duplicating transparency. Duplicating transparency, uh, I actually have done this before uh, with some of my E6 slides. So far, um, using this method, I haven't really encountered any issue. However, uh, what I have done before is um, sometimes I like because E6 they have slightly less dynamic range. Um, sometimes what I have done is I cheat a little bit by I shoot two shots of the same E6 shots. One slightly uh, I bracketed kind of like higher exposure, lower exposure, and I kind of overlay them almost like an HDR, and I seems to be able to pull back a touch bit more detail. Um, but I've also done it the lazy way where I duplicate the file inside Lightroom, create a virtual duplicate, and I export them with two different settings when I'm using Negative Lab Pro. Um, but sorry, I don't know if uh, you're also wondering if there are any other complication uh, scanning slide negative that you have ran into. Color shift. So color shift in this case, it's funny because I haven't, I haven't really dived into that. Reason being, I'm still experimenting a lot in shooting my portrait or my 400H negative very differently. And there's definitely color shift when I overexpose, underexpose it. Um, no, I haven't set that up just yet, but, uh, I would say in this case, um, the custom profile may not necessarily um, change the setup as much because uh, you would always still pick up the white balance through the, um, the color picker. Um, and when you use that function, most of them kind of go back to like um, status quo. The only difference I can see is if you scan the same photo using different um, camera bodies. That way, if you do set a custom color profile and then you select the white balance, in theory, you can kind of harm, or like you can kind of unify the color between different bodies better. Um, but yeah, that's all I can think of now. I wonder if that answers your questions. Okay, so flatbed film scanner, um, Flatbed film scanner is still very relevant. Um, I would say the advantage, the core advantage is it comes in when you're scanning 35 millimeter film. Uh, I find myself that uh, when I'm using my V600, say for example, the Epson V600, um, when I scan it 35 millimeter, I only get approximately 2000 DPI, like max 2000 DPI um, density. If I can go up to 3,000, but but it kind of a diminish of return when I zoom into the actual picture file. But when I'm scanning with a digital camera, especially for 35 millimeter, I find myself having significantly more details uh, in the green uh, and also in the little sharpness detail that I can find inside the, the scanning file. Also, um, the using a flatbed scanner, if you're using, say, if you're using Epson uh, and using the Epson software, 
it's really hard to get a consistent result between frames. Like even if you shot the same shot repeatedly, like say I'm shooting a model in the same setting here and there, I'll still see a slight discrepancy between each shots. But when I'm using a digital camera scanning it, I can apply whatever setting to shot number one. And I can, in Lightroom, I can copy that setting and sync it to the next shot and get the exact same kind of color exposure, uh, as long as I shot the, the film photo with the exact same setting. Um, what you can still do with a fill flatbed scanner is you can scan it and I'll put it as a digital negative, like a DNG file. And you can still use uh, negative, um, negative Lab Pro to process it and copy and paste the setting so you get the exact same setting between shots. However, when I'm doing that, uh, say when I'm doing that for a 35 millimeter, for a row of 24, it takes me hours to get all the digital properly scan um, to a digital negative just so I can edit it in Lightroom the same way with all the control that I have from a digital camera. Versus a digital camera, I can kind of shoot a shot. Let's see. I can shoot a shot, move to the next shot, take a shot, move to the next shot, take a shot, move to the next shot. It feels like it's significantly faster because as you see, like I just shot it. Let's say I shot the shot and I just moved to the next shot. So each shot roughly only takes about 20 seconds or less. Um, but yeah, of course, the downside is there's no automated feature. So if you enjoy having your automated feature on your flatbed scanner, you can still keep using a flatbed scanner for that purpose because you can leave it running. Uh, yes. Uh, now the tr so if you're just so the question is if you just uh reverting the curve and and also reverting the RGB, can you add it still add it the same way in Lightroom afterwards? Yes, you can. Um, the trick is uh, for me the tr hardest part is getting the RGB there. Um, I always seem to have a hard time tuning it, but in theory. Once you have inverted everything, uh, so you invert the curve, you inverted RGB, you can just create a new layer on top to um, to kind of change that. Oh, sorry. You know what? Sorry. I'm answering this as if I'm editing in Photoshop. In Lightroom, in Lightroom, what you do have to do is, because Lightroom, you're not doing layers the same way I'm doing in Photoshop. In Lightroom, uh, all your settings, because it's invert, so your, your white, your black, your shadow, and your, uh, uh, um, sorry, your shadow and your bright, um, sorry, I forgot, escape me. Anyways, all those tabs, they are in reverse. So let's say if you want to um, change your um, your white, um, how much exposure you have, let's say if it's slightly overexposing, you would probably not be shifting the white tab, you would probably be shifting the black tab because everything is inverse. So you just got to wrap your brain around it when you change it. Uh, as far as I can tell, I haven't really used Lightroom to do it, but by principle, that is what you're diving into. Uh, but definitely, it's something it's worth looking into uh, for YouTube tutorials if you're using Lightroom for that purpose. Uh, there might be easier way in doing this, but as far as I understand by principle, that's what you're changing. and sometimes a little bit harder to wrap your head around it. And I think the hardest part to wrap your head around is the color because they're also invert. So you're actually dealing with opposite of whatever, whatever color you're using or you're changing. But as long as you can kind of wrap your head around that, it's still doable. Best recommended settings on your absent flatbed. Uh, if you want to use Negative Lab Pro, um, I would say what I have used is um, I've actually used instead of using the Absent um, the Absent Scanner um, program, 
I have used ViewScan and Silverfast, but mostly I've been using Silverfast recently because I got a free upgrade uh, from Epson. Um, I would say use that, uh, use the Silverfast, and try and turn on the neg negative um, profile so you can scan it as digital negative, and you can kind of have a little bit more running room when you're converting the, uh, the digital negative into a positive. But you can also use that, uh, use the regular setup, and just kind of record what setting you have been using. Um, I kind of, they have, because I know in Silverfast, they have all these settings for different film, like a Fuji 400H, Portra, even VC, et cetera, et cetera. I tend to not like those. and But you can experiment with them to see what you like and try to write down notes in terms of what kind of color profile setting you have set up in there that fits your style. Um, because I find Silverfast and especially ViewScan to have more uh, kind of manual setting that you can play around with. And once you get the hang of it, you can actually crank up really beautiful negative uh, or positive in this case uh, of the photo that you have. Um, and also a little little thing that I've learned, uh, you might already know already, uh, with flatbed scanner, the longer you use it, sometimes you might find little artifact like a straight line on the film negative um, when you're editing it. Uh, they could be magenta color or pink color or anything like that. Um, what I found out is that it's the little calibration tab underneath the, um, the flatbed scanner. It's dirty, so all you need to do is like use a Q-tip and rubbing alcohol and clean that little piece up every now and then, and that line and some of those artifacts would disappear. Hopefully, that answers your question. Perfect. Any other questions you guys have? Oh, um, preference using JPEG PNG TIFF. Um, I, I'm guessing you're talking about the final output of the file itself and not the, not the, uh, not just the, if I'm scanning a negative kind of profile. Um, realistically, uh, TIFF would give you the most amount of data at the end um, compared to JPEG, because JPEG is mostly for quick small file sharing um, uh, and you want to make sure you get the exact color profile that you want for your client or for something that you want to share uh, for client because like some people actually use it for uh, weddings and events. Um, and you want to make sure whatever you see on your screen is whatever file your client receive or see it on their printing. So if you're exporting it to deliver, to give to your clients, I would say go for the JPEG. Um, for myself, I typically use a TIFF, or I actually export um, another DNG file that I have edited from Lightroom, just so I can retain the most amount of information if I ever want to go back and edit, that, edit the DNG or make small changes to the DNG. So I won't be having any kind of, almost like a destructive editing per se, Granted, your original file is ready there, your original file that you scan, but my workflow is I scan a DNG, or I scan a Sony negative for myself. I edit it and I export a DNG, and then once I, if I'm perfectly satisfied with my DNG, I tune it, tweak it just a little bit, I export that at the end into a JPEG for online posting or for, for my clients, for anything like that. Hope that helps. Optimum DPI setting on a flat bed. Uh, I find myself going, let's see. So like, uh, that's a that's a tricky question to answer because uh, it depending on the app that you're using and what kind of setting they allow you to set. Uh, off the top of my head, I haven't used Silverfast for a little while, but off the top of my head on Silverfast, um, I typically go, uh, I think 
two thousand like two thousand for the uh, DPI effect. If if I recall that correctly, I might be even off by a digit. Um, but it usually for a thirty five millimeter, it give me um, a ranging from fifty to seventy megabytes of a file to work with afterwards for film negative. Uh, that seems to be the most optimal. Um, some people would say you can even go for 3,000. I don't find that give me any better results than a 2,000 kind of DPI on it. Uh, but it's something that you kind of play around with. Uh, what I would say you can do, because I don't know which scanner you have, try to scan the same film negative with two different DPI settings, and then zoom in. Like when you when you blow it up, uh, uh, when you blow it up, zoom in and see if you can tell a major difference in how you consume it. Um, and by zooming in, I for, kind of forgot a step. So you scan both of those files, develop it, um, and then you export one of them to be, say, 24 megapixel, and you export the smaller one, the smaller DPI one, also to 24 megapixel, and then you see if there's a difference between the fine details. If you still see there's a fine detail, then go for the upper. Um, or significant detail difference, go for the upper DPI one. But if you see that they're very similar because they're kind of muddy, then you know you have hit the point of dimension of return and just go for the smaller DPI. So yeah, for me, I think I'm around 2,000. Any other questions? No? OK. Sorry, just to pop in like this. Um, yep. I wasn't sure if we're done with our slideshow or if yes, you right. want to still do that quick demonstration before we sign off. Oh, no. So, sorry, the demonstration I was talking about using the Lightroom to uh, convert that uh, file, but then I realized it's not showing any of my tool uh, off on the side for the slider. So, I just kind of showcased the, uh, the last slides with the little, little screenshots right there. Okay. Uh, was there any other further questions for Ken today? Um, he did a wonderful job. It makes me want to uh, dig out some negatives and give it a try myself. Um, and Ricardo, I am going to look into that, uh, seeing what the best uh, way to clean mold off the negative is, just so I can give you a more, hopefully, definitive answer um, to help you out. Um, and Ken, I'd like to uh, thank you for um, coming on, and and everyone has uh, definitely enjoyed the presentation. And uh, I know I've learned lots, and I'm a do-it-yourselfer, so definitely got my creativity flowing. And uh, if anyone's got any further questions, feel free to add them to the chat, and I'll try to get those uh, answered as quickly as possible. And if I can't answer them, then I'll make sure I uh, get them to Kin so he can uh, get those answers for you. Um, and just one last chance. Do you guys have any other questions? All right. Um, since nothing looks like it's coming through at the current moment, Ken, I want to thank you for coming to join us. I've had an extreme pleasure in uh, um, getting this all together for you and i really had a good time thanks me too me too all right well i hope to see everyone on the, our next presentation coming up soon and uh we'll uh we'll see you all on uh the next next show have a great day guys <laughs>